Greetings, everyone. I am Taifa Natalie Alexander, and I serve as the CRT Forward Project Director at the UCLA School of Law Critical Race Studies Program, or CRS. CRS acknowledges our presence on the traditional ancestral unceded lands and waterways of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, past, present, and emerging. We are committed to actively engaging and learning about the history of the lands we occupy, how to be better stewards of them, and continue to honor with intention and respect the historical and current significance of the enduring relationship between the Gabrielino Tongva peoples and the spaces CRS occupies. Thank you all for joining this CRS program, Mapping Anti-CRT Politics. Over the past few years, there has been an organized, well-funded effort to create unsubstantiated panic around critical race theory, as well as anti-racist training, teaching, and research. Political candidates have capitalized on this CRT disinformation campaign to secure their elections. Over the course of the next hour, our panelists, Professor Cheryl Harris, Dr. Latoya Baldwin-Clark, and myself, We'll analyze these trends in anti-CRT politics made clear through the recently launched CRS initiative, the CRT Forward Tracking Project. To demonstrate the impact of the CRT disinformation campaign on election outcomes at the local and state levels. As for an overview of today's session, I will briefly introduce my co-panelists, starting with Professor Harris, then Dr. Baldwin-Clark. Once I complete their introductions, we will then hear from Professor Harris, who will share some background on the attacks on CRT and explain how previous framings contributed to the attacks in their current form. Then I will discuss the anti-CRT candidate blueprint, as well as share pertinent information about the CRT forward tracking project. And finally, Dr. Baldwin-Clark will discuss trends in introducing and implementing anti-CRT measures and what CRT has to say about this particular moment. Throughout this session, please submit any questions you may have directly to me using the Q&A function. At the end of the session, we will attempt to answer all questions. However, depending on the queue, we may not be able to get to everyone's question. Finally, for those of you interested in receiving CLE credit, the CLE code word will be shared during the session. Again, thank you all for joining. Cheryl Harris is a founding member and faculty director of the Critical Race Studies Program at UCLA School of Law. Professor Harris serves as the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at UCLA School of Law, where she teaches constitutional law, civil rights, employment discrimination, critical race theory, and race conscious remedies. She's an author. She is an author of groundbreaking scholarship in critical race theory, including her acclaimed article, Whiteness as Property. Thank you for joining us, Professor Harris. Dr. Latoya Baldwin-Clark is an assistant professor of law at UCLA School of Law, where she joined the faculty in 2018. Previously, she was an Earl B. Dickerson Fellow and lecturer in law at University of Chicago Law School. Dr. Baldwin-Clark writes and teaches about education law, family law, property law, and race and discrimination. Thank you as well for joining us today, Dr. Baldwin-Clark. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Harris to the virtual podium to provide some context for the attacks on CRT and prior framings that have contributed to the attacks in their current form. Professor Harris. Thank you, Latoya and um, Taifa, for joining me in this conversation. And I hope that it will be one that will give you an idea of some of the work that we've been doing in response to this attack. Uh, I've been given the task of talking a little bit about the history, and uh, one way of thinking about what I'm going to say here is that it's kind of a prehistory of the attack on CRT. I think I now have uh, the technical problems uh, resolved, and I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay. Uh, just one moment here. Okay, here we go. So over the past several years, critical race theory has gone from being uh, a field of legal scholarship that was largely known in the academic community 
um, only in academic circles to a topic to be banned under proposed and enacted local state and uh, federal law. And it's important to ask why. Why has CRT suddenly become a topic of such interest, particularly in the context of the Republican Party's efforts to uh, take back uh, control of various legislative uh, entities? And what is behind uh, this tack? Um, in part, um, the focus on CRT um, itself um, begins with understanding why CRT has become this manufactured crisis, but it's a bit of a paradox to actually talk about what C CRT is in this context, because in many respects, um, the campaign against CRT is not really about CRT, as, as I'm going to relate to you. Uh, we know this because the architects of the CRT-related campaign have told us this, um, and, but there are no, nonetheless some important aspects about CRT as a body of anti-racist work that help us help explain how we got to this point. So CRT, to be brief, is a school of thought. It's a mode of analysis that started out in law that was trying to figure out how deep-seated racial inequality persists in a society that claims to be colorblind. And not only claims to be colorblind, but has through many decades adopted many laws and policies that were intended to eliminate it. There's often a gap between what the law says and how it's implemented, but um, with regard to CRT, we were looking in particular at the way in which anti-discrimination law, um, that is the adoption of laws like the, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, along with a host of other laws and regulations had basically stubbornly remain, um, um, allowed for inequality to remain. So part of this was clearly a consequence of a shift in politics, of conservative politics, uh, in which uh, political power, those in political power sought to redefine civil rights and redefine it in a way that narrowed the meaning of discrimination under law to the acts of bigoted individuals. Uh, but time and time again, uh, we were finding that uh, unequal outcomes were persisting even without any individual identifiable bigot or action. Um, there, that had to mean that there were other mechanisms at play, and part of what CRT was trying to do was to get at that. Um, we were challenging the idea that the history of slavery and apartheid in this country was over with emancipation and with Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and while the insistence on this ex excavation has sometimes been described as radical, uh, in fact, it's, it's a way in which the law is always engaged with history, and what we were doing was reading that history and looking at its um, it, its imprint in the present. So how did a society um, committed to colorblindness end up with so much visible racial inequality across the board? Um, so for 30 years, we continued work under this banner, um, expanding in important ways in terms of the topics that we took up, in terms of the influences of other disciplines. Um, but you know, for the most part, it did not have a lot of traction in the halls of power, to be quite honest. And while it was very influential among some activists and other people in scholarly communities, it was not a household word. So why then is it has it now become such a thing? So I think I want to start with um, the summer of 2020 and the death of George, George Floyd. We all know what happened there. It, it was, in fact, a signature moment in our history. Uh, and the recording of this horror basically seared the event international and uh, basically international consequences. This nine minutes turned out to be an eternity. Uh, and yet it was a moment in which our entire history was refracted. And it was also, as you recall, at the height of what I've tried to call the twin pandemics, that is the pandemic of COVID as well as the pandemic of racial inequality. And in this moment, what was galvanized was a sense of outrage as well as refusal a refusal to accept this uh, as normal, a refusal to um, say that this his death and the death of so many like him, um, the names that we know as well as the names that we don't know, had nothing to do with race. So people poured into the streets, lifted up under the banner of Black Lives Matter uh, that had previously been raised in response to prior murders. Um, and many things can and will be said about this moment, but what we, we can and should say is that it's clear that it was um, a powerful one. 
and one which in many ways rejected the notion of colorblindness. What we also know is that from patterns of history, and as my colleague Kim Crenshaw has, has written um, many years ago, um, that moments of racial reform are followed by periods of racial retrenchment. And we certainly saw that as well. Um, what followed in the wake of the George Floyd's um, and the protests that emerged as a result of his murder was um, the then sitting president, President Trump, looking for ways to push back. Uh, and um, this didn't turn out to be terribly effective, this mode of pushback, uh, where he stood in front of the church in Lafayette Square. Um, but this one did. Uh, what you have on your screen is um, one of the architects of the anti-CRT campaign, Christopher Rufo. Many of you all have likely seen this tweet, but Rufo was somebody who had been uh, around the edges of the conservative movement, uh, very entrepreneurial. He'd been writing about um, the problems that he saw with diversity training. Uh, and in this particular moment, he really uh, zeroed in on critical race theory uh, as a boogeyman as a container for all forms of anti-racist thought and basically um, went after it hammer and tong. Um, what, he, uh, what he portrayed was the critical race theory was essentially um, a repository, as he puts it, uh, of all the various cultural insanities uh, and the desire to then put it under the banner of critical race theory. So he says, we have decodified the term and will recodify it. So it's very clear that what he's saying is has nothing to do with critical race theory itself. It really has to do with recodifying it, redefining it with something that um, um, could allow for the kind of pushback that he and his compatriots uh, sought. Question is, why did it work? There's a couple of reasons. Here's my top five. Money. Money and money. Uh, what I'm trying to say here, uh, not to be too um, direct about it, to be, be one over the head, is that this was, this was not sort of um, a grassroots kind of effort. This was a very well-funded, very well thought out. And if you go on the web, you can see his media book, um, which uh, was uh, focus group tested, funded, and uh, very well organized, which is the other reason why it worked. But there's a fifth reason that I want to really zero in on today. Uh, one is, is that the message was not new. The medium and the messenger may have changed, but basically they were singing a very similar tune. You know, one, one might think of it as a new arrangement of an old song. And what is that song? Well, it has to do with the idea of equality and what equality means and the question of colorblindness. So I have here up on the screen the question of what does equal protection mean? Well, obviously an equal protection in the context of the law comes out of the 14th Amendment's guarantee, but there is no definition of discrimination. There is no definition of what a violation of equal protection means. And we can talk about why the framers of the 14th Amendment use the term equal protection and not the term colorblindness. Uh, that in and of itself suggests that equal protection means something other than colorblindness. But in any effect, in any event, the question is, what does equal protection mean? Does it mean equal treatment? Uh, here we have Anatoly France's famous quote, would suggest that sometimes it does not mean equal treatment because equality uh, for the rich and poor, he says, is going to mean something very different. And so if the law forbids the rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets and to steal their bread, on the one hand, that is a formally neutral law, but it has obviously deeply unequal effects. We also have this idea of equal treatment or uh, nonetheless, we nevertheless have this idea of equality as equal treatment that comes again out of history, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, this is the famous case involving Louisiana separate car act, which required equal but separate accommodations for the white and colored races. Um, in 1896, the court said, um, notwithstanding the fact that the separate cars were in fact inferior, um, the court said equal treatment is equal protection. Why? Because the rule applies equally to whites and to blacks. It bars whites from entering train cars where blacks are seated, 
and blacks from entering cars reserved for whites. So even though it's a rule, a rule of uh, racial prohibition, it was consistent with equal protection and formal equality was all that was required. Famously at the time, Justice Harlan dissented and said, and here we have the origins of some of the language that is with us today. This is one of the most famous dissents in constitutional law that in the eyes of the constitution, there is no superior dominant ruling class. There is no caste. Our constitution is colorblind. So in this context, colorblindness, uh, uh, Harlan is asserting, is a reason that the uh, rule of equal, pro uh, the rule of separate but equal is in fact unconstitutional because he's saying that it is not a colorblind law. It is in fact one which is using race to separate and using race to subjugate. Importantly, not just separate, but subjugate. Um, we can talk a little bit more about what uh, nevertheless Harlan went on to say about the relative position of the white race over non-white races, but that's for another day. What I wanna bring us forward to is now, what is the version of race embedded in the modern notion of colorblindness? Well, I wanna contend that colorblindness in the modern context is an argument that we should ignore race, primarily because of these reasons. One, race has no real significance. You, you hear this sometimes, race is only skin color. Race doesn't have any real meaning. Um, we also hear that if we pay attention to race, it's actually going to reinforce racism. So it's a consequentialist argument. It's an argument that if we in fact pay attention to race, we're gonna undermine the very thing that we're trying to achieve. Um, the other argument is, is that if we ignore race, we are in effect treating everybody alike. Um, by if we ignore the race of black people and white people and uh, Latinx people and Asian people, we're treating all races the same because we're not paying attention to anybody's race. Um, it also means uh, the common understanding of colorblindness is that we're being race neutral, right? Um, in law, these ideas have been expressed often by conservative judges in several different cases. Uh, in the first case, the first two quotes come from a case called Adirond, which involved a federal uh, affirmative action program for contractors. And in, these, in this case, which the majority struck down that, those provisions, uh, Justice Scalia said, well, in the eyes of the government, there's only one race here, it is American. Justice Thomas, there's a moral and constitutional equivalence between laws designed to subjugate a race and those designed to distribute benefits on the basis of race. Government cannot make us equal. And then finally, Justice Roberts in Parents Involved in Community Schools, a case from 2007 in which the court struck down um, a uh, K to 12 a student assignment program that was designed to achieve school integration. This would have been a normal form of school desegregation remedy, but the court struck it down as violating the constitution. And Justice Roberts said the way, the reason is that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, basically equating a desegregation remedy with a form of discrimination. Now, why do I put that up there? Well, because in effect, what's been happening over the last 30 or 40 years is the doctrinal erasure of structural racism. Um, we, we see this coming up in the context of rules regarding disparate impact. This is where you have a neutral rule but it produces racially dis disparate impact. The courts have said that's not sufficient to find an equal protection violation. We've also found in the context of affirmative action programs, the courts have said eliminating societal discrimination isn't an, a, a sufficient justification. Societal discrimination is another way of talking about structural racism. And the consequence is, is that the court is expressing the view that the existing baseline distribution of power and rights is race neutral and fair, and it's considerations of race that are not neutral. So the law, here we are, back to the sort of the, the notion of Plessy, the law commands e equal treatment, all forms of recognizing race, whether they're to impose a burden or to remedy current or past burdens are basically disfavored. Now, why did I bother to walk you through all that? Because there's a way in which what happens in the courts is also happening in the court of popular opinion. That is to say, what happens in the way that the court talks about race is the way that other people also uh, have come to talk about race. And particularly with regard to the dominant view, we have this idea in popular discourse that focusing on race leads to more racism. 
that focusing on race essentializes people and makes people only their race, and that focusing on race is unnecessary because most of us were taught not to see race and instead treat everybody the same. We also have an effort uh, afoot that happened here in California beginning in 1996, which is an effort to legislate colorblindness. So not just leave it up to the courts to decide on a case by case basis, but to actually affirmatively mandate it. And Proposition 209, the text of which you see on the screen, did not say affirmative action, but it, it equated affirmative action with preferential treatment. It said affirmative action was preferential treatment because it conferred an advantage on the basis of race. Um, the campaign around uh, affirmative anti-affirmative action campaign in Proposition 209 was a very, very important historical moment, not only because it was the first time that this had been taken up as a matter of popular referendum in an initiative in this way, but because it was a, a place in which certain of the ideas and arguments about race could in fact be rolled out and tested. And here you see one of the core ideas that came out of that campaign and upon which that campaign was based. If you refuse to consider race, that's race neutrality, that's being fair. If you consider race, if you actually have some consciousness about and focus on race, that's conferring a racial preference. So why do I put this up here? Because I think we see these same ideas emerging in the context of the anti-CRT campaign. What you have on your screen now is a uh, attorney general letter of opinion from the state of Montana in which he is taking up the question of whether or not critical race theory and anti-discrimination itself discriminate on the basis of race. Now recall, anti-racism and critical race theory both come out of the view that we need to have a deeper understanding of how racism operates in our society in order to be able to deal with it. But now we have the exact flip of the question. Uh, now, according to the AG, uh, critical race theory and anti-racism movements demonstrate, uh, it sounds pretty reasonable, that racism is widely understood and accepted as an epithet and encompasses vastly different meanings for different people. Hard to disagree with. However, here we go to the next and critical part. The gravamen of critical race theory and anti-racism theories, however, rely on the popular shibboleths of systemic, institutional, or structural racism. A minimal investigation into these claims exposes them as hollow rhetorical devices devoid of any legally sufficient rationale for purposes of civil rights law, as well as a threat to the stability of our institutions. So here we have, again, this kind of doc not only doctrinal erasure, but uh, a refusal to accept the notion that racism can be systemic, institutional, or structural. And to the extent that critical race theory or any other form of anti-racist practice insist upon that as a reality, insist upon the fact that the, the resulting racial inequality in our society is a product not just of individual bigotry, but is a result of systems and practices and policies, some of which say nothing at all about race, um, that, the, the act, that actual premise is being named itself as a violation of anti-discrimination law. So he goes on to say admissions that such as these may be good faith efforts, albeit misguided ones, but in practice they are used as a pretext to justify intentional discrimination against individuals on the basis of race. So now we have one step further in the argument. Not only is there no such thing as structural racism, not only is that is a uh, lacking any sort of legally sufficient rationale, it is a threat to the stability of our institutions and a pretext to justify intentional discrimination against individuals on the basis of race. The reason that these kinds of arguments can be made have to do with the fact that this is very similar to what was happening here. Uh, this idea that race consciousness is itself a form of racial preference is basically being echoed here. To, to tie all this off, uh, I wanna tell you about two um, uh, billboards that I saw um, several years ago when I was traveling through the South from uh, Atlanta to visit some relatives in Birmingham, Al uh, in, in Alabama, Huntsville. This one says diversity means chasing down the last white person it was put up by something called the White Genocide Project, which 
we're told by researchers is a white supremacist organization. Um, this billboard, uh, you can see uh, somebody is moving up there to take it down. Um, the local community nearby was appalled when they saw it. Uh, and this was not a, uh, by any means, a majority black community or a majority person of color community, but the local community just felt like this was uh, uh, um, uh, really uh, outrageous and moved to put it down. Um, this one, uh, I did not see personally, but this one was up in Harrison, Arkansas in 2013, uh, put up by a similar group, anti-racist is a code word for anti-right. Now, both of these were uh, obvious efforts by uh, organizations that were committed to uh, racial white racial hierarchy to solicit support, but not on terms in which they were explicitly arguing about white superiority, but tapping into the idea that anti-racism is a threat to white people. And what we have in the context of the anti-CRT campaign is the way in which these ideas have now been brought into at least the mainstream of a certain segment of the political spectrum and now is being enacted into law. I think it's important to understand what the origins are of these ideas, not just in terms of um, identifying uh, their, their kind of uh, unsavory roots, but in terms of understanding how and why we are in a moment now where this campaign has been able to take such traction. It's because they're repeating something they've been saying before. Um, with that, I, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues to continue and let me stop the screen share. Okay. Thank you for those insightful comments, Professor Harris. I can listen to you talk about these things all day. <laughs> um, but now we're going to transition a bit here. And so let me share my screen. So in the time that I have with you all today, I'm going to take a few moments to discuss the overall plan or blueprint anti-CRT candidates have been operating under in order to secure elections. I'm also going to share some more information about the recently launched CRS initiative, the CRT Forward Tracking Project, which provides academics, journalists, researchers, organizers, advocates, parents, teachers, and those who are committed to truth and justice with resources to better understand the patterns and trends in the recent local state and federal anti-CRT measures aimed at restricting access to truthful information about race and systemic racism. But before we start in an effort to give credit where credit is due, I would like to recognize uh, the CRT Forward team, including my colleagues here on the call, uh, faculty and staff at the law school, but also our undergraduate and law student research assistants who are integral parts of this team. And so since the introduction of the now rescinded Trump administration executive order 13950 and accompanying US Office of Budget Management memo, anti-CRT candidates seem to be following an effective blueprint to secure their elections. But what does this term anti-CRT mean? CRT, as Professor Harris has already laid out, is a practice that helps us understand how race and racism shape laws, policies, and structures, and is committed to changing the laws that have produced and reified racial inequality over time. As CRT scholar Sumi Cho has pointed out, though, through the CRT disinformation campaign, the term CRT has been co-opted, redefined, and repackaged in a way that displaces the true definition of CRT to allow for a mischaracterization of not just CRT, but all other concepts and practices that can be attached to it, like diversity and inclusion, for example. This is what's meant by anti-CRT, a commitment to the mischaracterization of the theory and a disavowal of the theory's true meaning. And so with the mischaracterization 
of CRT advanced through the CRT disinformation campaign, anti-CRT candidates have secured elections at levels of government um, and position terms like parents' choice or core curriculum and excellence in education or transparency and integrity as often as oppositional to this mischaracterization of CRT. So now that we have a functioning definition of anti-CRT and a better understanding of how a mischaracterization of the theory has been used to spread disinformation, in the remaining time that I have, I'm going to lay out a proposed blueprint outlining how anti-CRT candidates have been able to be so effective in securing their respective elections. The anti-CRT candidates blueprint includes four steps. The first step involves advancing and bolstering CRT through this, disinfor this disinformation campaign, right? And so anti-CRT candidates reinforce the CRT disinformation campaign by doing at least one of the following. First, committing to overturning pro-CRT policies, or two, taking a stance against addressing structural racism and ignoring the capacity of CRT to dismantle it. Further, these candidates misleadingly repackage these stances under the guise of being true candidates of their affiliate, affiliated political party, being committed to parents' rights, a core or enhanced curriculum, or protecting children. And so the next step in the anti-CRT candidate blueprint for some candidates involves re receiving endorsements or financial backing from anti-CRT political action committees. Once selected, these anti-CRT candidates, oftentimes supported by anti-CRT PACs, implement measures against identifying and addressing biased, racist, or discriminatory policies and practices. With upcoming primaries and general elections at the state and local levels, we're likely to see incumbent anti-CRT candidates following these same steps to secure their reelection. According to one political tracking website, anti-CRT candidates are already activating the first step in the blueprint. As of this month even, races in 716 school districts across 40 states featured candidates who took a stance on race and education or critical race theory. And so this trend in anti-CRT candidates' pathway to securing elections were made clear in part based on data from the CRT Forward Tracking Project. The tracking project identifies, tracks, and analyzes local, state, and federal activity aimed at limiting access to truthful information about race, racism, and systemic racism through strategies to reject CRT. In this video demonstration, you can see how users can navigate the interactive map by focusing on specific states to learn of all the anti-CRT measures in that specific state, or by using the filters to demonstrate national trends and the types of institutions being targeted, like K through 12, or the type of conduct being prohibited or required, like the banning of books or surveying of curriculum. So the CRT Forward Tracking Project is essentially a unique resource that allows visitors to better understand the assault on CRT and identifying trends, pathways, and patterns in anti-CRT measures, or step three of the anti-CRT candidate blueprint. Through the comprehensive examination of anti-CRT measures limiting teaching, curricula, trainings, access to texts and books and revisions to policies. So to be clear, the CRT Forward Tracking Project, through identifying, tracking, and analyzing anti-CRT measures at all levels, has exposed the anti-CRT candidate blueprint, especially step three, in being able to identify the drafters and supporters of anti-CRT measures, and step four, in seeing the frequency by which anti-CRT candidates are highlighting measures they've introduced or supported to restrict access to truthful information as a way to garner support in their re-election.
So to better understand how the blueprint is being applied, let's take a look at a local school board election in Colorado. So in uh, November 2021, Douglas County School Board, um, there was a Douglas County School Board election in Colorado. So four candidates initiated step one of the anti-CRT candidate blueprint. The anti-CRT candidates ran on a platform that included values like transparency and integrity, putting kids first and parent choice. And as I stated earlier in this presentation, uh, these concepts of transparency and parent choice and meritocracy are all terms that have been marshaled against critical race theory since the inception of the Trump administration executive order. Through substantively coding and analyzing hundreds of anti-CRT measures, my colleagues and I have found that functionally, these concepts of transparency and parent choice in this particular context are more akin to curricular surveillance and the option for students caretakers to withhold their student from learning truthful and accurate information about race and systemic racism. So the next step, um, following step two of the anti-CRT candidate blueprint, all four candidates were endorsed and received um, campaign funding from multiple anti-CRT donors and state level partisan organizations. Additionally, and more significantly, all four candidates were supported by the 1776 Project PAC, the only national school board political action committee. The well-funded PAC plans to quote, overturn critical race theory and the 1619 project, end quote, and funds candidates committed to doing the same. This year alone, the 1776 project PAC has won nearly 75% of all the elections it's invested in. And through support from the 1776 project PAC, Mike Peterson, Becky Myers, Christy Williams and Kaylee Weiniger raised over $300,000, nearly $200,000 more than their opponents to secure their election. So shortly after securing their election on a 4-3 vote, members of the Douglas County School District passed an anti-CRT measure that directly opposed the prior board's district-wide educational equity policy, which was implemented to identify and address biased, racist, or discriminatory practices in the district. So even though during consideration of the anti-CRT measure, public comments from students demonstrated an overwhelming disapproval of the measure, four board members overwhelmed the minority of the board and voted in favor of the anti-CRT measure. One board member used talking points from the CRT disinformation campaign in mischaracterizing CRT to support his decision to vote for the measure. And so the specific measure can be found on the CRT forward tracking project site by navigating to Colorado, clicking on local activity and activity pane, selecting the full text, which will pull up a PDF version of the measure. Essentially, the candidates who ran on an anti-CRT campaign and were supported by an anti-CRT pot just months prior were able to finalize step three of the anti-CRT candidate blueprint and pass an anti-CRT measure that impacts 67,000 students attending more than 80 schools in the Douglas County School District. And so these candidates were successful in implementing the anti-CRT candidate blueprint. It's important to pause here, though, to note that the Douglas County School District is not unique and that this blueprint can be applied to anti-CRT candidate races all across the country. And so, for example, at the gubernatorial level, Glenn Youngkin won the Virginia governor's race by reinforcing the CRT disinformation campaign and his campaign to become governor while on a televised broadcast, Youngkin positioned excellence in education against CRT 
misinterpreted Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, asserted there was no place for CRT in schools, and committed to banning the theory in schools when selected. And that's exactly what he did. On his first day in office, Yunkin issued some anti-CRT executive directives, um, including signing executive order number one on his first day in office, banning CRT and later established a tip line to report teaching of CRT in school. Both of Yunkin's measures can be found on the CRT forward tracking website. And so in thinking about re-elections, right, while there's no doubt that the Virginia governor has followed each step of the blueprint in reinforcing the CRT disinformation campaign and implementing anti-CRT measures once in office, there's another gubernatorial candidate who seems to have been utilizing the anti-CRT candidate blueprint to secure their election. And so with the South Dakota gubernatorial election taking place in November, trends in the frequency of anti-CRT measures introduced and implemented by South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem demonstrate that steps one and three of the anti-CRT candidate blueprint have been activated for quite some time, with more anti-CRT statements and executive directives than any other governor in the United States, including delaying social study standards and drafting model anti-CRT anti legislation. As early as May of 2021, Noam has simultaneously reinforced the mischaracterization of CRT to effectively implement anti-CRT measures. This has allowed her to garner support among voters who mistakenly perceive CRT to be in opposition to values like parents' rights and transparency. So one South Dakota senator, when asked about the proliferation of anti-CRT activity coming from the South Dakota governor found that Noam is a governor who is trying to get her name out. And sadly, that's what a lot of these bills are. It's to be used for election material and not to affect any real policy change. And so with all of that information, I want to share one final thought. So the information that I shared might seem daunting, but it shouldn't. What is a blueprint anyway, if nothing other than a detailed plan of what an architect wants pieces of a larger whole to look like? Plans can always change, especially considering the information we have available and knowing which school board candidates across the country have been endorsed by anti-CRT anti PACs and as a result have committed to implementing anti-CRT measures. And as equally important, the tools we have at our disposal, like the CRT Forward Tracking Project, assist us in changing these plans. So I'll stop there, but before turning the program over to my colleague, Dr. Latoya Baldwin-Clark to share more about additional trends from the tracking project, as well as what a CRT forward future might look like, I'm going to share the CLE code word. So the CLE code word is tracking. Again, the CLE code word is tracking. And so with that, I yield the floor to Dr. LaToya Baldwin-Clark. Thank you so much, uh, Taifa, And thank you also to Cheryl for um, giving us a good sense about why we are where we are. Um, and hopefully everyone can see what I'm showing here. Um, so what I want to do in my brief amount of time is just to talk about what are some of the trends that we're seeing um, in the actual data that come out of the tracking project. Um, and I think this is really important because we want to make sure that we can back up empirically the things that we are saying about what's happening throughout the country. And the tracking project really gives us an opportunity uh, to do that work. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things. So first, let's talk about the trends in timing. So we've identified over 495 efforts across the country. Um, the efforts, as you can see on this slide, were kind of slow going in the beginning. Um, but this is probably because policymakers and lawmakers were trying to figure out how to make sense of the EO for their own particular jurisdiction. 
So while we see a lull, in particular, if you look from August uh, 2021 to November 21, um, that also may be because we have all of these that are really focused on K through 12, and I'll show that in a few slides. Um, and what we know in K through 12 is that sometimes at the very beginning of the school year, it's very difficult to get things done because people are really thinking about the here and now. But you can see um, starting in late 2021 and going until now, um, they have really started to pick up in the last part of the year in the beginning part of this year. Um, and indeed, almost 41% of the activity overall since September 2020 has occurred in 2022 alone. And so this is really showing that these efforts are not slowing down and they're really becoming more emboldened, especially as we head into uh, midterm election season season for exactly the reasons uh, that Taiz just talked about and how these candidates are being pushed forward um, to assume these positions of power in local school court. Second, let's talk about the institutional targets. And so what you can see here is that far more efforts are focused on K through 12 than on any other target, right? So while the original EO talked about federal employees and contractors, um, these conservative agitators, as um, Professor Harris and as Taitha talked about, um, uh, uh, really saw CRT as a way to continue to assail public education in general. Um, of course, Chris Rufo also himself talked about how using parental outrage um, was the great political tool to be able to elect conservative candidates, not only at the state and federal level, but of course on school boards as well. Um, third, when you look at what efforts are actually being enacted, so what the tracking project allows us to do is to see not only when measures were introduced, we keep track of what measures are actually still pending, what measures have been adopted, and also which measures have failed or have been expired. So if you look at only those efforts that have actually come to a final decision, so whether it's been adopted or whether it's failed, you can see that in K through 12, um, over two thirds of all of the um, efforts targeting K through 12 that have had a final disposition have actually been adopted. And that's more than you find for other institutional targets. Um, higher ed is also coming in with being more likely than not um, to actually be adopted. But when it's targeting these other institutions, they're far more likely to fail than to actually um, be adopted and be applied to different people. Um, the fourth thing that I um, would like to show is that most of the efforts when we're looking at K through 12 is focused on classroom teaching um, and curriculum. So while the original EO was thinking about things like trainings and um, EDI, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, most of what's happening at the K through 12 space is really focused on teachers. I mean, again, this is a way of deprofessionalizing and of talking about how teachers are not really truly the experts of what's happening in classrooms and what's happening for children um, in a way that we can see these anti-CRT efforts also fitting into that general trend of attacking public education. Now, think about what are the contents. So within any particular effort, we've been able to code for what does the actual effort say? Um, what is it targeting? And we have all these different types of uh, conduct that's showing over and over again um, in the uh, efforts. And so one thing that uh, we noticed that these trends as far as who's being talked about in these efforts are pretty equal. So we have a number that talk about psychological distress of white children being psychologically harmed by learning about racism, um, also children learning about whether they should be responsible for the past, and also critical race theory, we're seeing that they're fairly even when it comes to the efforts that are actually introduced. Um, but what we do see, though, is that when it comes to actually adopting these efforts, it is much more likely for one of these efforts to be adopted if it mentions critical race theory and also the 1619 project. Um, and what this shows to me, what I anticipate, is that as candidates and lawmakers become more aware that actually using the words critical race theory in the 1619 project are more likely to rile people up and get them to get those measures adopted, we're going to see more and more of those efforts actually coming out and noting that we're talking about CRT 
or the 1619 Project, which will further really uh, diminish um, the truth behind what CRT is and also thinking about 1619. Lastly, I wanna show a little bit of the trends that we're finding at uh, the state and local level. So if we look at um, what's going on at the local level and we look at it depending on the political leanings of uh, the state, um, it shouldn't be unsurprising, I mean, it shouldn't be surprising that most of this is being concentrated in red states and in uh, purple states. So together in red and purple states, about 80% of the efforts are being uh, are coming out and are being introduced um, in those particular states. Um, of course, though, the efforts are widespread. So we're also seeing this in blue states, but to a much lesser degree. And within each of the states, we can see whether these um, efforts are more likely to be adopted or not. And so we find that in the red states and the purple states, you have a overwhelming, uh, greater, much greater than 50% of the efforts are actually being adopted. Whereas in blue states, you have a little less than that. It's not um, nothing, but you can see the differences between the political leanings of the state and the ways in which these efforts are being enacted um, or are failing. Um, and we can also see um, an interesting thing is to break down what's happening at the state level and what's happening at the local level. Um, so what I'm trying to show here is that in over 75% in blue states, those efforts are at the local level. Whereas in red states, about 75% are actually active at the state level. And so this is important for a couple of reasons. One, we can find that in red states, these efforts are going to impact a larger number of children, right? Because at the state level, um, those efforts are for all the children in the state and not in any particular school district. Um, but the another thing then to note is that in blue states, why is it that we're seeing all of this happening at the local level? Well, perhaps that's because at a state level, the general populace does not have as much of an appetite for these anti-CRT efforts. But if you're able to then get into local school boards, as Taifa was showing us, um, you're much more likely to be able to tap in to the uh, worries of parents that perhaps we think are red dots in blue states. Um, and so it's easier, perhaps, in a blue state to get things done at the local level than it may be actually in a red state because they have no need to do it at the local level. Um, another thing, uh, lastly, that I want to show, uh, a last thing that I want to kind of put out there is that in blue states, um, what we're also seeing is that those local level efforts um, are generally in places, like I said, red dots in blue states. We see this in California, where much of the red, um, much of the anti-CRT activity at the local level are occurring in school districts and, and counties that have a larger Trump-Biden relationship um, as of the last election that is greater than the state as a whole. So what I mean by that is that if the state has voted um, in a particular percentage where Biden won more than Trump, in these particular counties, we're seeing that the actual share of Trump voters is larger than what we see in the state overall. And so I just want to, these are just some of the preliminary trends that we're seeing that the tracking project actually allows us to really dig into um, all of these trends. Um, and there's a couple of things I really want to hammer in about why the tracking project is um, incredibly important at this time. So first, it allows us to track over time. There are many efforts that are still pending that have not come to a final resolution. I mean, we're able to follow and track those efforts as they move through the different legislative processes until they come to a final disposition. Um, the data then that we have is not static. It is not necessarily only looking at a snapshot in time. It allows us to look at how things are changing. And as we know how things are changing, we can then adapt our strategies in order to fix um, the trends, in order to more closely uh, look at the trends. 
Um, the other thing that we're able to do is we look at all levels of government. So we're not just looking at the state level, not just looking at the federal level, but doing the really hard work of scouring and looking for all of these um, local school district level activities. And then lastly, we are looking not at just bills that specifically say CRT, we're looking at bills in which there has been this conflation of ideas of psychological distress and guilt and anguish that are particularly thought, oh, this is coming from CRT, but actually are not. And so we're able to kind of pick up on that kind of activity as well. Um, what is it then for CRS forward? What is it then that we can see about CRT moving forward? Um, is that with this knowledge, we have a certain amount of power. With the knowledge now, we're able to create a blueprint, like Taifa talked about, of countering these anti-CRT bills um, with the knowledge that we have and with this data. Um, so I want to stop my time uh, there. I could talk about this for a lot longer as I've been digging into the data, but I know we want to get to uh, making sure that we have time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Baldwin Clark. Um, so we do have a few questions here, and I hope that we can get to all of them. Um, but the first question I'll pose to Professor Harris. And so this question asks, you know, considering that there has been this counter among uh, folks and saying, well, CRT isn't taught in schools, right? This was the early response to CRT is being taught in schools. Um, so the question here is, how do we combat that response? Right, and you and I have talked about, you know, people who have gone to school board meetings specifically in, um, I think it was Corona Norco school district to combat some of these bills and specifically a framing of CRT and in doing that was successful in defeating one of those introduced anti-CRT measures. So I'm wondering if you want to share more about how folks can respond and sharing more about what CRT is in an effort to define and not to defend? Yes, it's a very good question. And I have to say early on when I thought that the facts mattered, um, I was one of those that said, uh, well, critical race theory isn't really taught in K to 12. Uh, but it became quickly clear that since the target was not specifically CRT, but the entire range of anti-racist thought uh, or the notion of structural racism, that that was going to be a, a particular, not a very effective response, and it proved to be so. So I think one of the ways, uh, drawing on the example that you mentioned, Taifa, is to one say, uh, to specifically say that, to specifically say, it's very clear, um, based on what Rufo has said and others have said, that it, the target here really isn't critical race theory. Uh, because they've said that they intend to brand it uh, and redefine it. Uh, what we are saying is that critical race theory is grounded in the idea that racism in this country is the product of something more than bigoted individuals. And that is actually one of the deep ironies here that the claim that CRT is causing harm because we are pointing individual, we are pointing figures at individual bigoted children and uh, accusing them of being the cause of racism. It's actually the converse. What we're saying is, is that we're talking about the ways in which um, unintentional neutral rules can actually end up producing racism. That is not a radical idea. That is an idea that comes out of uh, social science, comes out of uh, social psychology. This is actually basically aligning uh, our thinking in law with what many other disciplines have been observing for a number of years. So I think part of the answer is to say, um, the question of whether or not CRT itself is being taught in the schools is not really the issue. The issue is whether or not we are going to educate our children to be able to fight racism in all of its forms, not with respect to whether or not an individual is bigoted, but whether or not the practices that we are engaging in are actually undercutting our ability to allow everybody to have an equal share. And so I think that that 
um, part of the way um, that I'm aware of, of at least some of the successful campaigns has been to actually lean into the notion that um, we need more discussion about race and racism. What I think we have here, and, and the reason that this campaign has worked, is a kind of functional racial illiteracy. Uh, and that's not anybody's individual fault. That's a byproduct of the ways in which both our law and our politicians and others have tended to reduce racism to the notion of individual bigotry. And so we don't have, you know, structural racism came, got put on the table through the summer of 2020. That became a term, but I don't think people quite yet fully grasp what that means. And so part of our task is to actually say, this is what we're talking about. Great, thank you. Dr. Baldwin Clark, I have a question for you. In thinking about the propensity at which these <clears throat> measures are focused specifically through at K through 12 um, schools, my question is what can schools do in order to overcome this assault? And is there a difference between um, what a school can do that is um, made up mostly of minority students? So um, I do a lot of work. A lot of my work is looking at um, the role of parents in schools in racial inequality. Um, and there were a number of questions that I saw in the Q&A that were basically on this. How is it that we can uh, get people to understand what's going on? Um, I believe that all politics is local. Um, and I believe that especially when it comes to school boards and schools, um, parents, many of these um, things are happening, as you said, Taifa, in places where, in general, the population is not really on board with this. Right? It's these candidates who are coming in and imposing things from the top down instead of from the ground up. And that's where I think we need to be. We need to be at the ground up. Um, I think sometimes we um, want to think very, very big, and I'm good with thinking very, very big. But I also think that if we are trying to impact the lives of children, we need to be where those children are. Um, and we need to be making sure that we're fighting back at the right level. Here, it's very clear from our trends is that the level is at K through 12. And so we need to be focusing on schools, even if we know that that really wasn't <laughs> the whole purpose of what Rufo was trying to do in the beginning, that's where we are. And because that's where we are, I believe that those are the places where we need to really be focusing. Um, and that means organizing parents. Um, I think this is especially important, um, as you said, in communities where we're not talking about uh, majority white communities, we're talking about majority minority communities where we're still seeing some of these efforts. And so a lot of this is about organizing parents. Um, I love the fact that you talked about a blueprint. Um, Chris Rufo actually also has on his webpage a um, parent's manual that is all about a blueprint of how you go about fighting CRT in your schools. We need to make our own blueprint that gives people the tools um, and not just the rhetoric in order to push back. Thank you so much. There are some questions here about um, the utility of the tracking project um specifically and how connections can be made and where folks can get the best information and i just want to share that the tracking project in of itself um, it's massive right we have now found that there are nearly 500 different anti-crt measures across local school boards county governments um, state non-legislative activity as well, statements that are made, state school boards that are making anti-CRT um, policies and procedure and things along those lines. So, um, and as Dr. Baldwin Clark is going through the tremendous work of um, going through all of that data and, and will be um, writing more about the trends and, and what we find in them. You can visit the CRT Forward tracking website and I will put it the link to it in the chat to learn more about other trends that we have found. But because we only have an hour with you today, cannot get to um, all of these amazing questions and links and things like that, but you can for find more information on the website, including 
blog posts um, that identify some specific trends and keep you up to date with the trends in the data as the data is updated as well. So I just wanted to make note of that. Um, the next question that I have is one that I'm interested in hearing from you both on. Um, this question is related to hope, right? And so considering the scale of this attack, um, Professor Harris, maybe we can hear from you first and then Dr. Baldwin-Clark. Um, considering the scale of this attack, how do we keep hope alive? It's always a challenge when you're under an onslaught like this one to be able to try to see the light of day. Um, but I like to think, and when I talk with my students and my colleagues about <clears throat> how in the past we've, pay, we've faced very difficult historical moments and, and ask the question, how do we, how do we get through? Uh, I mean, in 1896, I mentioned Plessy. What, what, what were the responses of the black community in 1896? after Plessy was passed. Um, and it turns out that um, part of the answer has to do with what um, LaToya was just speaking to, which is the question of organizing. Um, one of the ways that these campaigns work and seem to be um, sort of in, impermeable or um, insurmountable is the fact that they have in fact the, the veneer of majority um, support. But I, and I'm not trying to be naive or, or Pollyannish about this, but I think for the most part, uh, and this was also a question that came up, uh, I, I saw in the Q&A, um, there are many, many young people of all different races that hunger for this education. Uh, and it's not just the students that are in our CRT classes. It's not just the students that are in uh, LaToya's classes uh, on family law and on um, other topics. If you actually take a look, um, and my inbox tends to be filling up with them, of just young people saying, I want to know, and these are not all young people of color. Um, the very picture that I began with, which is those millions of people in the street, reflects the fact that there are people that are hunger, hungry for a deeper analysis of what it is that ails this country, because they want to grow up and live in a country that's different. They don't want to grow up and live in a country that normalizes the killing of black people by the state, by the police, and treats it as a normal fact of life. They don't want that. And if anything, I guess my hope lies in the fact uh, that when I look at those pictures, I'm reminded that this was after 40 years of official and judicial messaging that said race doesn't matter. It was supposed to work. There weren't supposed to be all those millions of people in the street, but they were there. And I don't think, you know, just because they went back home doesn't mean that their brains turned off. So I'm, I'm looking to this as a recognition of the fact that we may not have 20 million people in the streets today, but it doesn't mean that there are not people who are deeply committed and want to see actually the development and the possibility of a multiracial democracy. Because if we look at the consequences of the erasure of any kind of analysis, serious analysis of race, what we see is not only the burdens that it imposes on people of color and the lethality that it imposes on people of color, but what the consequences are for everyone, right? Um, so that's what I think gives me hope. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin-Clark. Um, I'm also very hopeful. And one of the reasons I'm hopeful is that um, I'm looking at these local school boards where you also have a lot of people who are rallying against the anti-anti, <laughs> rallying against anti-CRT, right? And so it's not just that school board candidates can be elected on this anti-CRT platform, but that we can also get elected people who are not anti-CRT. And actually one of the ways I'm seeing this a lot is that we have a lot of young people who are running for school board. So in the community in which I'm in, we have a um, young man who is running for school board. He was just a student a few years ago, but he knows what's going on in his schools. He knows what's happening at that level. And I think what we need to be doing is really support
supporting them as well. I'm also supporting our students, our, our high schoolers and our middle schoolers know what's going on here and they have thoughts and they have ideas that they wanna put into place in their own schools and in their school districts. Um, so again my, again, my research is at the local level and so I'm very passionate about the idea that we need to be organizing locally and our hope is in our children. Our hope is in this next generation that we're bringing up that can fight against these measures because they know that they're untrue. I guess, thank you for those comments, Dr. Baldwin-Clark. And um, I count myself as honored to be in a colleague of one of those students um, who was just brilliant. Um, and so, I, I'd like to weigh in here as well. And I've shared with folks on the CRT Forward team and I've shared with Dr. Baldwin-Clark and Professor Harris um, that sometimes this data, um, this work being engaged in this work can feel um, daunting, right? Uh, the number of attacks, the places that they're happening um, can make people feel overwhelmed in some cases, but like Dr. Baldwin-Clark and Professor Harris has said, um, this information isn't intended to be this way. The more information we have, the more successful we are going to be in being able to organize and being able to respond and being able to um, really go forward and ensure that this country can fulfill its value in being a multiracial democracy. And so, I'm hopeful um, every day that I get to come to work and work on this project with these tremendous um, scholars of critical race theory. Um, when I get to work with up and coming scholars and the research assistants that we have on our team as well. And so at this point, um, there are 21 questions in this queue and we have two minutes. So unfortunately, we won't be able to get to any more questions at this time, but I want to thank you all for joining this webinar, Mapping Anti-CRT Politics. Also, again, I want to recognize the CRT Forward team for their efforts on this project and making this information available and accessible to the public. And thank you all for joining us and be sure to follow CRT Forward and CRS on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and all the social media things. And with that, be well, everyone.